So like I said, welcome everyone to the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility Intro to AI-Driven Science on Supercomputers. Uh, my name is Paige Kinsley, and I will be the facilitator for each of the session, uh, each of the seven sessions. Um, I am the education outreach lead at the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility. Um, and how we're going to start today is um, giving a little bit of an overview to Argonne National Labs and also specifically to uh, the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility. So you know sort of who we are and where we're coming from what, and what our expertise is. Uh, so for those who don't know, um, the U.S. <clears throat> Department of Energy has multiple national labs across the country. There are about 17 of them, um, and the national labs function as a place for research and also as a host for a number of very large facilities like the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility. The research that we do sort of spans everything from the subatomic all the way up to the cosmological. Um, it's often in the energy space, but at this point we sort of do science for everyone. Um, specifically, um, Argonne National Laboratory uh, is located just outside of Chicago, Illinois. Um, it came out of the University of Chicago's work on the Manhattan Project in the 1940s. Um, and it is a multidisciplinary science and research center. Um, we do work, uh, uh, there are researchers at Argonne that do work um, spanning sort of every uh, every field of science. Uh, and also Argonne is home to the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility. The ALCF um, is a supercomputer user facility that um, it provides resources to researchers from across the world who want to use our supercomputers for their science. Um, we have, for to, to use the facility, folks apply to um, get an allocation on our, our machines. Um, and from there, they're able to sort of, it, it enables their science to, to run huge simulations and be supported by some of the world-class scientists at Argonne as well. Um, specifically, some of the systems that we have, just as a brief overview, um, we, uh, ALCF systems have evolved a great deal um, since 2004. Um, our most recent system, Aurora, is an exascale system. Um, one of the second, it's number two in the world for um, Exascale, um, the other being Frontier at Oak Ridge National Labs, our sister facility. Um, for this uh, series, we're going to be using um, Sophia, which is a smaller system, but really, really helpful for training as well. Um, and very similar to Polaris, which is another one of our, our um, uh, production systems that's currently being used by researchers from across the world. Uh, some people may ask, so what do people do on these supercomputers? Um, a huge amount of things, um, especially in the AI space. Um, so there are a huge number of researchers that are using our, our machines um, for AI for science applications. This is just a couple of them. Um, one being predicting virtual drug responses in cancer cells um, using image recognition, um, mapping neural uh, neuron networks from electron microscope data, and also the analysis of complex crystal structures with neural networks, uh, and, and many, many more. And as part of this series, we want to sort of expose you to some of the things, some of the specific research that's being done throughout the series. And so each session, um, uh, each session will end with a, a researcher from Argonne who's using AI or, or machine learning in their research at Argonne. And this will span a huge number of different fields. So if you're interested in one, um, there's a good chance that you will see somebody talk about it. Um, so just to give you an overview about sort of what you're learning in this series and maybe what to expect, um, the, the series will be run by a, a number of um, computational scientists who are here at Argonne. They're pictured here. You'll see them in real life um, as the series progresses. And what they'll be talking to you about, uh, we'll be starting with the fundamental math be behind AI and machine learning, understanding sort of what neural networks are, um, unboxing them a little bit and how they can be built from the ground up, and then understanding the fundamentals of large language models specifically and their applications, and thinking about in all of this, why we need supercomputing in AI, like why why are we we're doing um, AI on supercomputers, and then how to run large scale training on supercomputers themselves. So, like I mentioned before, uh, each week um, this will sort of be the set agenda um, for what you can sort of expect each week. So we'll start 
um, with about an hour of session content and hands-on opportunities. Um, and then uh, at 410 Central each day, we'll have a science talk from an Argonne scientist and then a Q&A after. Um, so as um, questions come up both during the session and also during any science talks, please throw them into Slack and we'll make sure that we get to them. Uh, so a little bit of uh, logistics, format, expectations as we go through. Um, and hopefully this answers a number of questions that you might have. Um, for the session of logistics, um, like I mentioned, for those who um, recently come in, please change your Zoom name to your first and last name that you signed up or that you registered with, um, which helps us sort of keep track on who attends each week. Um, as you have questions, please, please ask them on Slack and not in Zoom, um, in part because um, Slack will stick around, obviously for Zoom, once the, the session is over, all of those questions and all of that content will be lost. Um, so as you have questions, please ask them on Slack. Uh, for the materials themselves, um, all of the materials, um, the guides, the session materials, hands-on exercises will be found on the uh, work, the, the session's GitHub. Um, you should have a, a link to that. We'll also send it out in Slack again and also Zoom. Um, Along with the session content itself, GitHub will also have information on how to submit homework, um, how to access ALCF systems, which I'll get to a little bit more, and just on using Jupyter Notebooks generally. Um, recordings and slides will be posted by the end of each week after, um, after the session itself. Um, so if you're not able to make it uh, uh, one specific week, you'll be able to potentially access the recordings on a separate period of time. So for hands, the hands-on um, pieces of each session, each session will have a hands-on component where you will be able to run code um, based on sort of what the instructor that day is telling you about. Um, for this, uh, uh, this series, we're doing things a little bit different than we've done in the past, but I wanted to outline it because I know there have been questions. So for sessions one through three, including today, we will be using Google Colab to run um, any hands-on materials because we don't need a huge amount of computing power. It's free to sign up for, it's really easy to access. And Huejo, who will be our instructor today, will give a little bit more detail on how to access that um, as we go through. For sessions four through seven, uh, we will be using ALCF machines, specifically Sophia and then the and the AI test beds. I've linked here in this, and all of this will be sent out as well if you want to look about, look, um, dig into the machines themselves a little bit more. Um, to access these, I have very specific instructions on how to access this. Something that's really important is that um, to access ALCF machines, you need to submit an account request or re account reactivation by this Friday, October 4th, 2024. Um, we understand that this is sort of a short period of time. Um, we'll send out more information, all of this information on Slack as well. But if you want to have access to ALCF machines by mid-series, please follow one of the instructions. Um, for anybody who currently has an ALCF account, it's just um, a matter of requesting to join the project. It's ALCF AITP, which is long, just copy and paste it. Um, for those who do not have accounts, um, we have a link to submit an account request and then join the same project. And then anybody who has an inactive account, you can also reactivate it following these instructions. A couple things to note on ALCF accounts. Um, one uh, is when requesting an ALCF account, you must use your institution email to sign up. If you use a Gmail or something like it, we're not going to uh, we're, not, we're not going to approve it. We're not going to be able to approve it for Department of Energy security reasons. Um, like I mentioned, any account requests submitted after fourth can't be guaranteed to get access to ALCF systems. And finally, unfortunately, because of DOE restrictions, Department of Energy restrictions, participants who are not at US-based institutions can't be guaranteed ALCF accounts because of security reasons. Um, however, any participants that don't have ALCF accounts are still welcome to attend sessions. Obviously, the first three sessions potentially uh, will be run on Google Colab, and some parts of sessions four through seven could also be run on local machines. Um, so it doesn't restrict you from necessarily being able to participate, but you won't necessarily be doing it on ALCF systems. Um, so for series format and expectations, um, any questions that you have about ALCF user accounts, 
please drop in the ALCF help desk Slack channel for a prompt response. Um, there is an email support at alcf.anl.gov that you could potentially send questions to, um, but they will be answered faster if you drop things in Slack instead of sending over email. So please, any questions about user accounts, send it to that Slack channel. Additionally, um, we will have weekly homework. The homework is not um, required, but um, those who finish and complete homework um, will be uh, eligible for an ALCF AI for Science digital badge. Um, this digital badge is something that is shareable um, on LinkedIn or the like. And what the requirements or expectations are around the badge is those who complete homework for three sessions or more, any of the sessions, any of the seven, will receive a beginner um, digital badge. And those who complete homework for all seven sessions will receive an advanced digital badge. Um, we'll have a specific Microsoft form that you will submit homework on um, that will be posted in Slack and was also sent over email. Um, in ho homework submission, there's more specific detail on how to submit it on GitHub, but what you'll be doing is essentially submitting a link from your GitHub repo that you forked um, for that specific uh, session. Um, but again, all of that detail um, that sort of walks through how to do that will be on GitHub. Um, a couple series guidelines just as to sort of set precedent. Um, something that's important in all of this is that we have um, a huge array of people who are attending um, from high school all the way up to like senior staff um, at universities at uh, in industry and also at national labs. Um, so we have a huge array of um, uh, knowledge and, and expertise. Um, and in all of this, I think be, being curious and, and asking questions is really important. Um, and recognizing that nobody has a monopoly on wisdom. So everybody is probably experts in different things um, and we shouldn't necessarily um, expect, don't, don't have one person, one voice being the only voice that's maybe answering questions or asking questions. Additionally, be respectful to all participants. Um, hopefully this is something that you all sort of expect, but I wanted to underscored again, um, because we're all coming from different places, diff with different expertise from different fields. Um, some people may know more things and some people may know less thing, fewer things. So being respectful to each other as we interact both on Zoom and on Slack is really, really important. Um, with that, before I hand things over to Huejo, I wanted to pause um, for any questions that might have come up um, and then we can sort of jump into things from there. And I see one question, if we can't attend the webinar, but submit all seven homeworks, are we still eligible for the advanced badge? Yes. So the, the badging, we, we recognize that people's schedules are probably a little bit crazy um, and that this is sort of a voluntary thing that you're coming to do. Um, so um, for those who can't necessarily attend live, but are able to watch the, the videos themselves and then submit homework, you're also totally eligible for digital badge. We don't necessarily expect you to be here at this time live every single se um, session, um, just based on recognizing that people's uh, schedules are a little bit flexible. Um, another question is, is, can we ask questions to the speakers asynchronously? Um, yes, you can, that's what Slack is for. So all of the speakers will be on Slack. So if you have specific questions as they come up, please drop them. You notice that we have, um, sort of seven different Slack channels for each session. Uh, so as you go through um, the, uh, you'll ask any specific questions for a specific session will be dropped in that session's channel. Um, and the, the speakers will be sure to sort of watch and ask and uh, um, answer questions as they come up. Um, one question, can the recordings be posted sooner than Fridays? We're going to push for it, but at the end of the day, we still have to, there's a, a matter of um, adjusting the the recordings a little bit just so they're they're intelligible for people. Um, so we'll try to get them up as fast as we can, but um, we can't necessarily promise any sooner than Friday. Um, uh, okay. And will you be sending the access instructions on ALCS machines on Slack? Yes, we will. Um, 
And one other question, is there any opportunity to enroll workshop for new students? Unfortunately, registration is now closed. However, because all of the recordings will be uploaded every week, anybody who isn't necessarily registered now um, can access all of the material sort of as they come up. So um, we can't keep people in, but we can um, give people access to the materials themselves. Okay, um, so with that, um, as you have questions, please drop them in Slack or on Zoom if you don't have access to Slack and we can figure that out. But I wanna hand things over to Huiho Zhang. Um, Huiho is a computer scientist here at um, the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, and he's going to give everyone sort of an intro to AI, specifically on supercomputers. I'm gonna hand things over to Huiho and also ask that he give um, all of you a little bit of background on who he is um, and what he does at ALCF. So with that, Huiho. Okay, thank you, Paige. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you all see my screen? Yes, but flip your um, flip your PowerPoint. How about now? Wonderful. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm, as a page said, I'm a computer scientist at Argonne Leadership Computing Facility. Uh, my background is actually physics. So I tend to think everything in a physics way. And as you will see later on in my kind of lecture, um, I joined Argonne about uh, eight years ago. Uh, it was a time that AI become more and more popular. So I kind of witnessed uh, how AI change the the world especially in the scientific computing you know so welcome to join this exciting topic uh the whole training series and um, so but today's topic is um as you see a called intro to ai on supercomputers so apparently i will be talking about supercomputers uh what is a supercomputer and and then also on ai and how uh, why we need a uh, supercomputer to to train AI models, um, and from the title you also see uh, the the level of this difficulty of this lecture is uh, intro level, right? So so I will be talking kind of things in a um, higher level, um, conceptual level, and so I expect that uh, this lecture will be simple. Uh, and actually, last time when I was uh, presenting the same material, I asked my wife to join, who is not uh, a kind of computer scientist. She, she studied uh, civil engineer, and and then after after that uh, the lecture, I asked her how much she she uh, received from from this presentation, and she told me that she got eighty percent. Right. So so I think uh, uh, this is. Uh, aim to be a simple lecture, but I think this uh, AI is a is also a very profound concept. So even in the simple presentation, you will see some kind of interesting and profound uh, concept behind this. And so I will be uh, talking basically the three things. The first two things are related to supercomputer. Uh, I will talk about on the hardware side, hardware side, the evolutions of the computing systems. And then on the software side, I will kind of share the fundamental concept about parallel computing, which is the algorithm that, uh, that we need to use to drive a supercomputer to do scientific research. Um, then on the AI side, I will talk about the concept of AI and then use a very simple example uh, to demonstrate um, the the AI and that simple example, as we will see, that every kind of almost everybody knows that, and we we learned that from high school, but just that we didn't uh, think these things in the perspective of AI. All right. So the key words for this lecture is supercomputer, parallel computing, and AI. All right. And hopefully after this uh, lecture, you will be able to share this uh, three uh, the meaning of the three words to your classmate, or your parents, or your 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 uh, your friends. Um, so I will start with the, the history of computing. I want to ask a question to all of you. Uh, what is the first computer in the history? And when 
when did it come out? Uh, if you are bored and love, you can unmute and, and answer. Otherwise, you, you feel free to post in the chat. I will give you five seconds. Okay, I think time out. I saw a few answers. Uh, let me see what I can see. Okay, Abascus. Very good. Uh, human computing. A human, the Turing machine things uh, proposed by it. Yeah, I, I think all of these are very good um, answer. And the answer that I will show probably will surprise you. Uh, I, I don't think you will guess this. Uh, if you if you know this, then you must be the one who already attended my lecture last year. And so this is, I consider, the first computer, All right? So I think uh, um, probably this is also the tool that we used, uh, majority of us that uh, we used to do computation, right? Addition, subtraction, et cetera. I was told uh, by my elementary school teacher to use my hands, right? And I believe that is the first kind of tool that uh, the whole kind of in a human history people start to use. Because I mean, obviously we have 10 fingers and that's probably why we are not using the binary in the, in, at the first time, right? We're using 10 kind of decimal um, like in, in our number system, right? So, so I think uh, most likely our ancestors was using these hands to do computation, right? Um, but of course, uh, is limited because you only have 10 fingers, right? If you do addition, you probably can only do like uh, uh, the numbers that with the summation less than 10. Um, and uh, a slightly more complicated version is all kind of tools like similar. And this is a tool that my daughter used in her school, uh, in a Montessori school here at DuPage County. And essentially they are uh, using this bit and there were two set of beads, one hanging on here, and then the other set of beads is uh, setting here. And, and she was given a, a kind of a question sheet uh, to calculate the additions. And basically she would take like the first number from the, those uh, hanging on here, and then the second number uh, sitting here, right? And then just count how many, if they put these two together and count how many beads there are, then that would be the answer, right? And and as I was uh, kind of dwelling on this, I, I see this is actually, this simple thing is actually profound, right? So, and the first thing is that actually we use the tool to store the number, right? So there are two numbers here. The first number is stored with those uh, hanging here, and then the second number is those uh, sitting here, right? And on the other hand, it's also um, kind of make the calculation simple. Uh, we don't have to think too much in, in our brain, um, but we just, when we put the two things together, we just count them one by one, right? And then we get the answer. So my daughter was uh, able to kind of do this uh, one equation less than five seconds, right? And she, I think she was like three or four years old during that time when I was invited to the school um, to, to see what, uh, what she's studying, right? So I think there's two important things we see again and again, and even in today's uh, supercomputer. First is to restore the information on the tool, and then the tool, which in this case will be the computer, also have the way to operate on the numbers, right? And then give us the answer. Uh, of course, in today's computer, uh, the amount of information that we can store on the computer is huge. And then also the computing power is uh, is a lot, right? Uh, as we will see later on. Um, a, a more complicated version is the uh, this called calculation uh, counting rods. And if you are Chinese, you know some Chinese, you know it's called suan chou. Uh, a suan means counting. Chou is uh, some kind of stick made with bamboo. If you know Chinese character, the 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 kind of counting and then. These two Chinese sketcher here listed are all with bamboo. So it means that actually our ancestor in China 
use the bamboo stick to do calculation. And the way it's kind of similar to finger, uh, one is just one rod, two is two rod, three is three rod, right? Four, four rod, five, five rod. But then they figure out if I keep putting like six rod to do, to represent six, then it's kind of complicated, right? So they come up with this, how about I just use horizontal line to represent five. And then the vertical one, verti vertical to represent one, right? So that kind of uh, make it a little bit simple. And then uh, it also saves some space, um, physical space for putting this rock, right? And but, but on, on the other hand, you also see that this is also limited and, and it's very kind of um, inefficient. And actually in China, in China, probably the, the max num the maximum, the biggest number that the Chinese can think about is 10,000, you know, like in Chinese it's called Iwan. So basically uh, when you say Iwan, which is 10,000 in Chinese uh, kind of minds is basically infinity. So if you, you can see a lot of in Chinese literature, they use the, the character Wang represent many or infinity, you know? So that's because that's the maximum number uh, that we can handle with this kind of tool, right? Um, later on, we, uh, we also have this uh, Abacus, and actually many of you uh, put this as the, consider this as the first uh, computer, right? And it's, it's kind of useful um, and, and very, very uh, efficient in calculation. And so basically this is kind of similar to, to this calculation rod. We have the two panel, the upper panel, each bit represent five and the lower panel, each B represent one, right? So, uh, and, and, and then there are some kind of rules to help um, calculation. One of the very famous uh, rule, if you are Chinese, you know, is uh, called san xia wu chu er, right? So um, it, it's kind of how you represent three. It's basically you pull one five from the upper panel and then you remove two, right? Because five minus two is three. Right. So it's a, this kind of rule help people to do the calculation using the abacus very efficiently. And then later on, this uh, phrase three, set five, remove two, become a phrase to describe when we do things uh, efficiently without hesitation. And this become a common phrase, right? Uh, of course, uh, this actually originated from this uh, abacus uh, uh, calculation. Uh, later on, we also have, uh, this is the kind of invented by uh, the, in the Western, Western world called slide rule. Basically you're able to slide and this, this, uh, uh, this rule can calculate very complicated things, even like a square root, um, you can calculate with this rule. Uh, if you are interested, you can Google it and then you'll find out, wow, this is extremely complicated. I, I was amazed at how uh, people can come up with these complicated things. Uh, and then uh, people start to kind of think about how can I make things automatically, right? Uh, like, they, is there any kind of mechanical ways? And two mathematicians come up with this mechanical calculator. The left size can only do addition and subtraction, uh, but it's a very good that this can, because of all the wheels here, it can do automatic changing. So I say that if I have three, plus seven, it should be 10, right? And then this, uh, this, there will be a one carried over here. And so this, it's a very automatic way of calculating addition, subtraction. You don't have to count the, the, the number of bits anymore. Uh, you just rotate, set the number, and then you get the answer. Uh, you can read out the answer automatically. And the, the, the one on the right hand side, it's um, slightly more advanced, it can, uh, not only just to addition and subtraction, but even the multiplication and division, right? Um, then uh, I skip over like several hundred years. Eventually we have this uh, first uh, really, really, I consider the elect computer. And it's actually is a electronic computer called ENIAC. It was uh, built in 1955, uh, 45 or 46 timeframe. Um, and, and there is some interesting fact about this uh, computer. So the size is actually very huge. It's uh, 30 times 50. It's uh, 
1,500 square feet. It's almost occupied in one house, right? Uh, and it is also very weighty. It's uh, 30 tons. And, and it's, it was made by uh, vacuum cubes. It uh, contains 17,000 vacuum cubes. Uh, and you may think that this uh, huge uh, computers uh, be kind of like uh, very powerful. And, and it is indeed like we, we should call it supercomputer, right? But actually, isn't it's it is not a supercomputer in terms of computing power? It's a supersized computer, right? In terms of the computing capability, it can only do like five thousand operation uh, per second. Means that it can can solve like five thousand equations uh, uh, in one second. And so it's it's actually very very kind of like um, not uh, efficient at all, right? But anyhow, this is kind of give us the first. Uh, trial of using electronic computers. And they don't own the same concept. Um, I mean, there's evolution from this same kind of model, but be become more and more uh, capable uh, by changing the components like from vacuum cube to transistors. And, and then because of the uh, advance in semiconductor, we're able to integrate uh, a lot of these transistors into a single small chip. And this uh, dramatically reduce the size of the computing uh, co computing device, and so now you can have like very little phone ho uh, holding on your phone, uh, on your hands, and this form is actually many order of magnitude faster than the uh, the first uh, kind of electronic computers, um, and it's actually it can do like ten to the power of uh, twelve. Um, you can say equation per second. So it's very uh, uh, powerful. And, and this is, a, is a, due to the advancement and the chip design. And so the size of the transistors reduced from uh, 10,000 nanometer, which is a 10 uh, micrometer to right now is less than five nanometer. I think the most recent one with uh, iPhone 16 or 15 was with, made with uh, three nanometer transistor size. And, and, and because of the size is so small, you're able to integrate like um, a huge amount of um, uh, transistor in a single chip. And this dramatically improved the computing power. Um, and so this is uh, not only make the single chip, single CPU more powerful than before. Also, people think about like uh, scale out, like, put like multiple of them connect them together with the internet. And so that we can create these uh, so-called supercomputers. So essentially this uh, schematic product of the supercomputer is that we have multiple nodes and within each node, we have a CPU and GPU. In the system that you'll be using Sophia, it contains uh, eight NVIDIA uh, A100 GPUs. In Polaris, we contain uh, four A100 GPUs. And anyhow, this is a single node, and then go across across a different node. We connect it with the high speed network, so that when we do the computation, they can communicate with each other to solve a single problem collectively in co in a coordinated way. Um, and then also the data, uh, unlike the uh, your single laptop that we have a hard drive on attached to the laptop. Uh, the, the data is also distributed in a parallel file systems. And so the, all the computer has to access the data uh, through the network. Um, and so the, this is the kind of like uh, the, um, the, the design or the schematic of the supercomputer. Um, and the right-hand side is the photo of uh, Aurora. And you see all those cables uh, high-speed interconnect uh, network cables to connect all those uh, um, uh, kind of uh, nodes together. And, and I, I believe you come to ALCF to have a tool in Aurora, you will see a lot of interesting fact that like if you, if you pull straight all the cables, you will see that it will surround the, uh, the, the earth several times. And then you, you will also know like how much water it, it is needed to cool down the whole system. And then also how much uh, kind of electricity consumed. Um, yeah, I, I won't disclose all the interesting details, but, but do come and visit. And, and this is the outside, uh, the cover. 
And now, and this this uh, plot shows that throughout the years, um, the increase of the computing capability, um, uh, and so in the H in the high performance computing, um, kind of community, we have like the list of the top 500 list, like in terms of computing power. And here I plotted the uh, the computing capability of the number one um, number one systems on the top 500 throughout the years. And as you can see right now, so far um, we have the frontier and my, we believe that when Aurora is running in the full machine mode, this will be the fastest uh, um, computer in the world. And this is, uh, in access scale, access scale means the 10 to the power of 18 um, um, operation per second. And, and so as you can see in the past, like uh, three, maybe 30 years, the, it, it's kind of advanced a lot in terms of the computing power is uh, one more than one million times, right? And right now, the, the phone that you're holding is much more powerful than the first uh, supercomputer in the 1990s. Um, <clears throat> and, and you already see this plot uh, from page uh, introduction. These are the uh, system that ALCF owned, right? Currently, we have the Aurora is under testing and will be open to the public soon. Um, and the production machine we have is the Polaris. Um, and and Sophia is a small assistant. And, and as you can see earlier, this is a 5.7 terafoot, our first uh, kind of supercomputer at Argon. It's kind of similar performance to your laptop. Um, but now it's a uh, several order of magnitude faster. Um, and in terms of the science, we have uh, a lot of different area of science that the supercomputer can help uh, to do the simulation. For example, the cosmology, uh, the evolution of the universe. We were able to see how the universe evolved after the Big Bang, and and then how the galaxy are formed, um, and etc. Um, and there are some videos that you can find out from the ALC website to see the simulations. And a lot of study on material science, calculating the electronic properties, mechanical property, and biology, protein folding, and also climate more climate science like modeling. Um, et cetera, and, and engineering. Uh, a lot of our computing time was spent on like com computational fluid dynamics to de for design the, uh, the aircraft, uh, combustion engine research, et cetera. And, and recently more and more um, AI and data science uh, uh, applications become more and more dominant um, and rising up become kind of uh, more uh, important um, than the uh, kind of like the, the traditional HPC simulations. Um, so why do we need supercomputing computer for AI? Well, actually the, the AI become possible primarily because two reasons. I mean, even I think even in 1940s, um, we already have the like Turing's concept, right? How, how can we design a intelligent machine so that we it's kind of in um, distinguishable from human. So the concept of AI is not new, but why until kind of the recent decades, it become possible. The, the reason is that AI is learning things from data. So it need huge amount of data to train the model, right? So now because of the, uh, uh, the internet, we, we have uh, a lot of data available. And so we can train the AI model. And on the other hand, it's also the training AI model is extremely expensive. Um, and it is not possible to do like 20 years ago. Uh, only recently we have the, because of the advancement of the computing architecture, like the NVIDIA's uh, graph, graphic um, processors, GPUs, and other kind of long uh, architectures, um, tech specs for AI, now training AI model become possible. And so this uh, table just give you a kind of a, 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 a sense of how expensive um, training AI model is be. 
And so the size of the model is categorized by the number of parameters uh, inside the um, model. It's actually in billions, billions, uh, uh, like hundreds of billions, even trillions. Um, and, and, and so actually this model is huge. Uh, even just saving this model, uh, it will take several terabytes. Uh, recently, I was doing a one trillion size model. Uh, the model size plus the um, all the parameter, it would take like eight, 18 terabyte, which cannot be stored on my laptop, right? Uh, and then and and even if we train like with thousands of GPUs, uh, it will still take like seventy four days or one hundred days, right? So, so it's extremely expensive. So we need like large supercomputer. In Aurora, we are having like 10,000 nodes and each node contains 12 GPU tiles. So that's in about like 100,000 um, kind of GPU tiles. And so we're hoping that we can reduce the training time um, by order of magnitudes and then also increase the size of the training. And actually at Argon, we are, we are in a, um, we are doing, and we are, uh, having a project called Aurora GPT, we want to train a GPT model kind of similar to chat GPT, um, but will be primarily used for scientific research. So we will train this model with a lot of scientific artic articles, journal papers, and so that it can do science. Um, and anyway, so basically training this uh, is very expensive, right? So we need a supercomputer. Um, and and how do we drive the supercomputer to do the training? You know, so because uh, we see the supercomputer is connected, connecting all the uh, GPUs uh, together, and how do we coordinate the GPU to do the training uh, together, right? So um, in the literature, primarily there are two types of um, uh, parallelization. The first one is uh, data parallelization, basically, uh, each GPU will have a single model, and then but it will train on the subset of the data. So we divide the data set so that uh, um, the um, the total time reduced. So this is called data parallelization. The other way is a called model parallelization. If the model is so big that it cannot fit into a single GPU, then we have to split the model and distribute that into multiple GPUs. And so this is called model parallelizations. I think this uh, we will have more detail kind of discussion in the later on uh, lectures. Um, but overall, it's essentially we want to divide this uh, training work into different GPUs. And actually, in in the training large language models, uh, we distribute this uh, in kind of multiple ways. To, to so in the large language model is kind of layer based, and so we we do like split each each layer into different GPU into uh, I mean divide divide each layers so this is called tensor parallelizations so divide the tensor and we also split uh, distribute the different layer into different GPU so this dimension is called pipelining parallelizations and then not only that we are actually so also divide the data set and so that we are doing sharding of the data set so kind of a hybrid uh, model parallelization and tensor parallelization. So we will be able to kind of train this huge uh, data, I mean, huge model. Just give you a sense of uh, recently, I was uh, training, uh, I was doing some study on a 1T model and I was uh, using about like one, uh, 700 uh, GPU card to GPU tile to, to, to do this, uh, to distribute this uh, the single model. And then I will be kind of running multiple instances, instances of the seven, 700 uh, GPUs to spread the whole machine, right? So it is very expensive. So, okay, for now, we kind of get a sense about uh, what is a supercomputer. And then we have some kind of idea about the parallel computing, right? Uh, so I have a, a small, um, demo to, to kind of play with this uh, concept of parallel computing. Um, so I will go to the, uh, and this is on the GitHub repo. Um, 
So this is the this is on the GitHub repo. And and if you cannot catch me step by step, you feel free to do it later on. Uh, I will show it for now. So so this is is the AI training series uh, um, uh, GitHub, and then today we are on the first one. Um, and the example that I want to show is the calculating the pi in parallel. So, uh, and this can be run on Google Collab. So the way I also give it instruction on how to use the Google Collab. So you'll go to this link to sign up in accounts and then open this notebook. So for now, I think I already have that. Uh, so if, if I click that, I will just need to point to the right uh, GitHub repo. So this will be awesome LCF, uh, the GitHub repo. And then I need to find the, the specific. As you can see, there are a lot of uh, GitHub repo because we develop a lot of software in Algon. And so this is the GitHub repo. And then we just open this one. Um, and we can run this uh, little example. And so the concept is that um, we know that the value of pi is a 3.14, and then you and then there are many digits continue, right? And uh, a, a simple way to calculate the pi is by dropping a lot of points on this square, and then we can count how many of them are within this uh, this uh, circle, right? So if you calculate on theoretically the the number of inside divided the, the total number of points um it should should be proportional to to the uh, the area right if the uh, all the points are uniformly distributed and so this will be four over pi in another sense pi will be four times the number inside divided the total number and this is exactly what is implemented in this python code so uh I just generate, um, I said like 500, this is a kind of small case, 500 points, and then uh, generate randomly for the X and Y coordinates, and then compute uh, the total number of uh, points four into uh, inside of the circle, right? And so if we run this, you will see, uh, I actually color differently. If it inside is a red point, outside is blue, blue point. And as you can see, as the number of points increases, the, the value pi here uh, calculated or estimated pi is closer and closer to the real um, value, right? Which is 3.14. Um, and statistically, the error will be proportional to one over square root of n. Means that when you have larger number of n, uh, you can get uh, more accurate um, estimate of pi, right? And so, so this example, example of course, is uh, do it. We we call it sequentially, right? I just have like one. You can imagine that one person keep dropping the points, right? Um, if I want to do it in parallel, say that I have multiple person, then actually I can also um kind of that like four different kind of person four different person drop this point and then sum over all the points inside from the four different people right i can speed up the process right because each time four person will be dropping four points right so this is much faster um and this is the basic concept behind this uh, computing right so i'll have to this example it's a, a simple Python code you can read in detail later, but it's essentially doing a similar thing, except that right now I um, I said like total number of points is uh, 5 million, but actually the first person only dropped like one fourth of that, second person dropped another one fourth of that, et cetera, right? So then at the end, I have to do a summation. Uh, this is a kind of the communication involved and talking to the other three persons and then find out what's the total number of points inside the circle, right? Um, so I will 
okay, this one is already finished. So, um, and then you can run this. This is the code to run. Basically, it will get the Python code, install the package read needed. And this is the MPI for Py. It's a Python uh, library that can do the MPI communication. Uh, it might take some time in your case, uh, especially in installing the MPI for Py. In my case, I was uh, kind of installed previously, so it recognized that I don't need to reinstall um, again. Right? So, and then here, just we run this application. Basically, MP1 means I use one process to run the application, right? Um, and, and then you can find out the, the value and then also the total time, right? And then you, you can increase two process, full process, um, in the Google Collab, every time when we come here, it's kind of get assigned to different different kind of hard, hardware. So maybe different time, you will get different answer. This is the time that I got um, probably last year. I have like, if I do one process, I get like five seconds to finish the calculation. And if I do two processes, it's a 3.4, right? Not completely two times uh, faster. The reason, is because actually the, the hardware got assigned to me doesn't have more than one CPU. It's a kind of a, a very poor uh, resource. So so I that's why I have to do the oversubscribing. So he, here, so basically actually, uh, sometimes you will see it's not increasing at all uh, by increasing the number of process because the hardware uh, is limited, right? Um, later on, you can run uh, when Sophia is available. You can run on Sophia. Sophia, definitely on each node, we have more than one call, and you will see the linear speed up. And this is the case that I run on Polaris similar machine last year. And you see one, two, four, eight. And this is the value. Uh, and then the time is almost linearly speed up, right? From eight seconds to four seconds, two seconds, and then one second, All right? Um, if you are interested, you can run here. Uh, this is on the Google Collab, and and you'll find out that actually it's not no no linear increase. I tested it earlier, right? It, because of the limited resource. So on one process, it's one node. Um, then the other um, yeah, okay, you can see still nine point one zero, right? Slightly faster, um, but not not really two times because they only have one core got assigned. Even if you put two processes, but that two processes was fighting with the computing resource, right? It's not actually spread over two, two cores. And, and so, yeah, but, late, but later on, uh, in two weeks, you will be able to run this example and you will find out that. Um, so, um, but, but from this simple example, we kind of know this uh, concept of parallel computing, essentially, uh, and compared to the sequential one, now we have like multiple worker, multiple processes, and they might doing a similar thing, or they might doing different kind of thing, right? So, so, but at the end, we have to do communication. Uh, um, actually, while they are doing the job, they might be doing the communication. Um, in this Pi example, they do the communication only at the end. But in a lot of real case, the communication has happened throughout the uh, the, the the simulation, right? So a important thing is to minimize the communication overhead, and then also distribute the work kind of in a equal fashion as much as we can. Right? So this is the uh, the the uh, pie example. Uh, if you cannot catch up here, feel free to play with it later on. Uh, I will go to another one. And this is the AI, right? So we, we talk about the supercomputer. We talk about the concept of parallel computing to drive uh, the, the, the supercomputer, right? Now, I want to talk about AI, right? And but in a very simple fashion, um, this is again the the in the you can open this uh, notebook. 
Um, I think I already opened it up here. I will just go here. So on the top level, um, so what is uh, AI training? I, what is AI training? AI is uh, different kind of from the traditional science or traditional computing. Uh, traditionally, we learn a lot of equation. For example, if you're physics um, majors, we learn Maxwell equation, general relativity, and those rules are written by an equation. So we learn those equations and then we do simulations to get our result, right? Um, but in AI, we're actually learning from the data, right? To, to make it more concrete, I, I, I always use the example of learning English, right? So I came from China. I, the first time I learned English was in my high school. And, and uh, when I learned English, I was told by my English teacher a set of rules. And those rules are grammar rules, like the past tense, present tense, and what kind of clause, how to use that. And so I try to memorize all those, uh, all those things. Then I, I try to speak the language. And I found out that I always made mistakes, even though I memorize all those uh, rules, right? So I will constantly say that I see a dog yesterday. And actually, it should be I saw a dog yesterday. And my daughter correct me all the time, right? And, and actually, she learned the English in a completely different way. So we never taught, taught her English. We always speak to her in Chinese. Um, but one day, she just speak to us in English. Uh, you know why? Because she was uh, watching a lot of uh, kind of uh, YouTube video, uh, like Papa P, uh, Coco Melons. And, and then she wasn't taught all those grammar rules. But because she kind of have a lot of input from the languages that sentences that is spoken in a video, she pick up, right? Um, although with the kind of uh, UK accent uh, many times. So she, she saw a lot of sentences like, I went to school yesterday, uh, he played basketball last week. So she figured out that it's a kind of tense, even though she might not really kind of come up with this grammar rule, but somehow all this pattern, all this kind of rules or connections was encoded in her brain, right? Without even having certain kind of rule written down. So our brain um, is capable to kind of capture all these fundamental patterns behind the data, right? And, and, and we capture that in a black box way. We don't need to come up with a rule, right? And this is the, essentially the, the, what an AI model can do, right? So, so one of example, if you play with this uh, ChatGPT, you know, if I ask the ChatGPT, say I got an A plus, I am very what, right? Feel the the word, and ChatGPT because it was trained by all the sentences available on the internet, and it's so so many sentences that I got a big present, I'm very happy. Uh, I got to UK, I'm very excited. So he kind of kind of captured that word. And statistically, uh, ChatGPT knows what word to put here, right? Because it had been seeing so many sentences in a website and, and, and then all the patterns, all the kind of rules and underlying rules and laws of language was uh, encoded in this uh, big neural network. And it was able to make the prediction, right? And you find out that prediction is pretty much very good. Um, and and even, even it can be very, very complicated. So for example, here I asked ChatGPT to write a poem about Albert Einstein, right? And, and if you read in detail, it is very, very good. It said, Albert Einstein mind of swirling walls with unkempt hair, right? So he, his hair is, uh, his appearance was a lot of unkempt, unkempt hair, right? And he also talked about the special relativity E equal to MC squared, right? Um, and then general relativity, it says that through space and time, uh, he boldly sailed in relativity's embrace. So this is talking about general relativity. And then talking about he was fighting for the for for not using the nuclear weapon, um, a, a plea for peace, right? And then a summary. 
So you can see it's kind of pretty good. And then also it follow the structure of a point. And you can see uh, unfurls world, serum machine, right? Slow flow, birth goods, right? So this structure, it looks very good, right? So the why it can come up with this kind of point. First, he has all the information about uh, Albert Einstein, right? And also, it, it, it has, it see a lot of uh, poems, other poems written uh, about other things, right? This information about Einstein together with the pattern that he see from other poems, these two connected together come out with this, uh, with this uh, Albert Einstein uh, support reading about him, right? So this is a kind of, because of the neural network, as we see, they have like hundreds of billions of parameters. It was able to encode all the complicated things about the data, right? And come up with a good condition. So this is a kind of the, the essential things um, behind these uh, AI model. Um, and, and large language model is so capable and almost we can think that it can solve all kinds of problems. I believe that, that the reason behind this is because we can convey almost everything in language, in words, right? We can write a paper in words and publish, right? We can also write the music in words. And so language can convey almost everything. So if a model who is capable to deal with language problem, and then it can deal with all kinds of problems, right? It can solve all kinds of problems, right? So it's a very generic model. Uh, and it has been shown it can be applied to a lot of areas, right? And, and, and I'm expecting to see that this become more and more powerful and penetrating every area of our kind of like life. And, and, you know, when I think about this, I was reminded one verse in the Bible, which is John 1, 1. He says that in the beginning was the word, in the world was with God, in the world was God, right? And then they don't in verse, and they don't even talking about everything came into being through the world, right? So we can see actually, uh, according to the Bible, God create things according to the word, right? God speak and then things came into being, right? This is the kind of uh, uh, inspiration that I have when I really look at all of this. Mm. Yeah, so, but but today I just want to go through a simple example so that you can you can kind of see the, the concept in this AI model in a simple example. And this is the linear regression. Uh, probably many of us learned that from the high school and essentially, we have a bunch of lines and we want to um, kind of have a, a bunch of points. We want to have a, a line that is fitting this point, right? Um, and of course, this parameter, we only have two, this model, we only have, have two parameters, um, the slope and the intersection. And so we kind of know how to solve this problem, right? So this example is, uh, the the, pri the the square footage of a house and and then the y axis is the um the the price associated and we know that the bigger the house is the more expensive the house will be right of course uh, there are many other factors that uh, how old is the house and and then also the region of where the house is located has a lot of dependence um will determine the how much how much is the house cost, right? But anyhow, uh, if we just consider the square footage, um, it's kind of linearly um, proportional into certain uh, estimation, right? And, and, and these are the kind of data. Um, and as you can see, this is kind of on the cheaper end. Nowadays, it probably is all these houses are not in the Chicago land, and Chicago land will be much more expensive. Uh, but anyhow, we know how to solve this problem. Um, basically by drawing a line so that all the distance of the points uh, from the point to the line will be minimized. And this is called uh, this square fitting, right? And we can, um, I just quickly go through all that. And, and there's a mathematical formula um, <clears throat> can do that, right? So we can just solve this exactly. And, and then it basically, and this is the model. 
uh, it's a uh, $87 uh, dollar per square feet. And then there's a base kind of money um, for the house, right? And then we can see how good this one fitting the um, fitting the real data, right? So it's not too bad, right? So and based on this line, we're able to predict how much how much uh, the house cost um, for for different square footage, right? Um, so of course this is, we can solve it ex exactly, but how about we we solve it in a AI way, right? So in the AI way, it's actually going to a very fundamental way of things that is kind of mimic to the process how we learn is by we guess one, one value. And then if it is not good enough, we adjust that value and keep adjusting until we get better and better, right? So that process called supervised learning. And, and so the way to do that is actually we just uh, have the model and then we calculate the the loss. The loss is the discrepancy be between the real, the best best uh, guess and versus the, the one that I initially guessed, right? So, so then of course this will be determined by the model that I have in this. So uh, this is a loss and then I have to keep adjusting, right? So the loss curve is like this and then maybe in the beginning, my loss is here, and then I just keep adjusting the parameter. The x-axis is the parameter, and then I should be able to reach to the minimum, right? So this uh, process is called uh, gradient descent, right? By adjusting the parameter in the model to, to, to minimize the discrepancy of my prediction to the real data, right? Um, and, and of course, the, each step, I have to know the slope so that I know how to go downward to get into the valley, right? So this is the, the kind of fundamental concept. It's very simple. Um, I just uh, quickly go through that. And then this is the way to update. Once I figure out the slope, which is the, the um, where is the downward, and then I jump one step further to the downward direction, then that's the update, right? And then so, so we can have an initial guess and this initial guess may be pretty bad, uh, as you can see here, uh, the loss here. And so this is pretty bad. The apparently is far away from all the points, right? But with this uh, concept, we can keep adjusting, right? Every time we, 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 can, we can have a guess and then adjust the slope and deception. And you can see the blue curve, the blue line is the one that we theoretically calculated. The right one is calculated using this uh, AI training process, right? And so you can see it's uh, smaller and smaller, and eventually it kind of match to the uh, exact solution that we get from um, before, right? So just kind of recap the whole process, and you can go through the detail around all the cells, right? But the concept is that uh, is in the supervised training fashion just kind of like when we learn things, we have uh, some trials and then the trial, we have some teacher who supervises us can, can kind of give us feedback, right? And based on the feedback, we adjust, right? We adjust. And that's a kind of the training process, how this AI model can adjust itself uh, to make better and better prediction, right? Um, now, uh, just one, well, a couple of minutes more is, re of course, here in the example, if you see in detail, I was uh, calculating the loss for the entire data set, right? In the real training, of course, actually, is we do a kind of mini batch training. We see some certain data and then calculate based upon that subset of the data and adjust. And then when new data come in, I keep adjusting, right? It's kind of our learning process is that we learn uh, through our experiences. Um, but we see the experiences in different time, right? Later on, we see more and more experiences, and then we learn more and more things, right? So same thing here. We want to train this model in that fashion is that we want to see the data uh, gradually, not see all of them at once, right? So we, we see that batch by batch, and each time we see one batch of data, we adjust the parameter, right? So the homework here is that to implement that mini batch training 
to improve the model in a batch by batch fashion, right? Um, so, so I think you can do it afterwards. Um, and I think, sorry for running a little bit over time, uh, but basically this is the, 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 the content that I have, the supercomputing sensor system and then the parallel computing and then also the concept of AI. Yeah. So, and, and I'm happy to take a uh, question offline um, and on the Slack. Thank you, Hoyo. Yeah, so as if you have any questions about any of the content that Hoyo went over today, feel free to drop them in Slack and he will definitely be available to answer them as will other folks at ALCF. Um, now we're going to switch over to something a little bit different. Um, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Troy Arcamano. So Troy is a postdoc uh, here at Argonne National Lab who's working on machine learning applications for weather and climate in the Environmental Science Division. Uh, during his time at ANL, uh, he was the Argonne lead for several projects, including a large collaboration to create a state-of-the-art foundation model for weather prediction. He received his PhD at Texas A&M University, uh, where he was working on developing machine learning applications for weather forecasting and investigating how machine learning could be used to improve climate models. Uh, today, he's going to be speaking about AI um, and how its revolution in weather and climate. Um, so with that, I will um, hand it over to Troy. Um, as he speaks, if you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the Slack. Um, and we'll have a few minutes at the end to, to ask a few things. So Troy. Thank you so much, Pave, and thank you, Weho, for that really nice introduction about large language models. As that will, the technology behind what has enabled the field of large language models will be quite prevalent in this talk. So, as I mentioned, this will be a talk on the AI revolution for weather and climate. But before we get into the AI part, I want to just give a little bit of background on what actually goes into weather forecasting. As we've seen in the note, uh, the news: Hurricane Helene has been a multi-billion-dollar disaster with devastating amounts of loss of life. So it's no surprise that weather forecasting is this multi-billion dollar enterprise. And despite you know us just getting notifications that it's going to rain on our phones, what sits behind that is actually a very large amount of research that has gone on for the last 45 years um, and even before that. Uh, currently, the way we do weather forecasting is using machine or is using physics-based numerical models. So no machine learning. Um, but that'll quickly transition. Um, but this has been a very slow and incremental progress. As I mentioned, it's been steady, but really over the last 40 years, we've only gotten a few days better of weather forecasting with millions of dollars into research and uh, many teams around the world. This is a very large collaborative effort. We really only get one day of forecast skill per decade of research. While this is obviously still amazing because we are able to predict these extreme events like Hurricane Helene up to eight days into the future, it's still not getting us perfect weather predictions. As we all know, when the weather app says it's not going to rain, and then we end up having to walk through the rain to our cars, um, especially in Chicago in the Midwest, where we can get some quite chaotic weather. But this very quiet re revolution that's been going on behind the scenes has quickly become very loud. Um, with the advent of machine learning architectures, such as transformers that sit inside large language models, the development of hardware, um, also driven by these large language models. Now that we have very large GPU machines, they are beginning to be used for not just training large language models, but many other applications, one of which is weather forecasting. Um, weather is particularly uh, a nice interest of, for these large companies because there's a lot of data available. There's petabytes of data for weather that sits on the cloud and is easily accessible and open license so that anybody can use them. And this has really set the stage for this paradigm shift in weather forecasting. What was taking decades worth of research to get in um, a weather forecast to improve by one day is now being done with just a few years of research with machine learning. Um, and it really is a paradigm shift as I'll show in the next few slides. And these have been demonstrated now to be used operationally. So the weather forecasts that went into extreme events like what we saw last week are be utilizing these machine learning based models and they are now orders of magnitude more efficient. So not only are they green um, and sits with the future um, vision of all these operational centers to use less carbon to produce these forecasts, you can also run many more forecasts than what we can do right now. So it just takes a few seconds to make a 10-day forecast. And instead of needing a warehouse size machine, you can probably just use your laptop that you're viewing Zoom on right now. So it really is a monumental shift that's going on in weather forecasting. And just to visualize what this looks like, 
one of these panels, so I'm showing four panels for a hurricane forecast from last year. One of these um, panels is the world's best numerical based model that had 40 years of research and it's run by the world's best operational center. Um, and the rest are machine learning models developed by private companies. We have things like Google, NVIDIA, and <clears throat> Highway in China. And I really like recommend looking at these and seeing what's the difference and stuff. They're all predicting a powerful hurricane that is eventually going to miss the coast off the coast of the east coast of the united states but if you were a weather forecaster and up or a man or emergency manager in new york um this information is invaluable instead of having to evacuate people you are able to keep people tight and know that despite being very close the hurricane will inevitably miss your um area so these are really getting into the hands of the people that need them like operational weather forecasts and they are starting to make a difference um with that, I'll just show which ones the machine learning ones. So we have on the top a um, NVIDIA-based model that uses neural operators. We have a Google-based model that uses graphic neural networks. We have a vision transformer. And then on the bottom left, we have the best traditional numerical weather model. And it's just really remarkable that just seeing data over and over again, you can make forecasts into the future um, with really remarkable accuracy and high computational efficiency. So it really is a paradigm shift. Machine learning is also being used for a lot of different applications now in the weather and climate field. Just what I was demonstrating is data-driven methods. These are just basically time series predictions that are independent of the physics-based models or equations. We have hybrid modeling that <clears throat> Google has been very interested in. This is the combination of mixing machine learning with the traditional numerical-based models. And these have a number of benefits as well. We have operational forecasts. So when you get those um, severe weather alerts for like a tornado watch when you're in the Chicago area. Um, we have machine learning products that are now helping give better accurate forecasts for severe weather like NATO cast. We have predictions for the ocean. Hurricane intensity forecasts were quite pivotal last week for um, predicting where Helene was going and how strong it would be. We have uncertainty quantification and basically everything else that's going on in weather and climate machine learning is being used for just to give a little bit of like context and how this is just a really much different than your traditional machine learning based fields. Um, essentially what you're doing is asking the machine learning based model to predict the three-dimensional atmosphere for up to 14 days into the future by just giving it a snapshot of the current conditions. Um, so it really is a monumental task and it's quite remarkable that machine learning can do so well. Um, and the data set that we used is observation based. So this is like the best guess of the atmosphere that we have at any time. And these basically span from 1940 onwards when we have satellites and measurements. Um, where we really differ from other machine learning models is, or other machine learning fields is how big of the data sets are. We're very used to images and machine learning being, you know, 64 by 64 or 128 by 128. Um, those are moderately sized images, but they really aren't affecting um, they have memory on GPUs, but these images for weather are very high resolution. They can be up to 721 by 1440, and now it, people are even using images that are larger, like 5000 by 4000. So these really become a challenge from a machine learning perspective. And the other big difference is instead of just having three channels for red, green, and blue, we now have hundreds to thousands of channels, each of the channels representing a two-dimensional weather field, things like surface uh, winds, surface temperature, precipitation, and we have then fields all the way up to the top of the atmosphere. Um, so having to adapt both your software and hardware for these data sets is both a fun challenge, but an engineering challenge in itself. Um, we have to create complicated loss functions um, using VIT images for image translation instead of generating images or generating text. So you're really pushing the forefront of what the current machine learning architecture is doing. Um, and I'll just present a few slides of what we've been working on at Argon using weather-specific VITs to predict the weather. Um, as I was mentioning, this is kind of how the task is looked like. So we start with the initial conditions that we want to fit into or put into our machine learning based model, and then we want to make subsequent forecasts. Here in the middle, we have an example of a five-day forecast by the model that was developed at Argon called Stormer. And then we also have the ground truth. And we can see that the five-day forecast is remarkably accurate compared to the ground truth. Um, we are successfully able to make a prediction of this powerful and extreme event that was impacting the North Pacific a few years ago on um, New Year's Eve of 2020. 
despite the initial conditions looking nothing like that. So we can see that the model had to create these storms, move these storms, all by just using machine learning instead of numerical based methods. So, and we can do it at a fraction of the cost. Um, just to give a little bit of how we take a vanilla vision transformer and adapt this to machine learning for weather, we have to do a number of things. But the first thing we looked at was getting the state of the art for vision transformers, um, what Microsoft or Meta has been working on, specifically with the adaptive layer normalization based VIT. Um, we also had to do things like variable aggregation and tokenization. So as I mentioned, we have many different channels that represent many different atmospheric variables. However, the information that is held in those channels are actually quite redundant. Um, temperature is related to moisture, moisture is related to temperature, et cetera. So what we can do is have the machine learning learn how to correlate those variables and compress the data so that we can actually fit both the model and these very large images into the GPU memory. Because without this, the model would quickly blow up um, the GPU memory and we wouldn't even be able to train it. Um, so this was one novel idea. And when you put a couple of others that I won't have time to mention into this, you get a very state-of-the-art model. So here we're comparing Stormer in green compared to the other data-driven models, Pangu and GraphCast, as I was mentioning, and also the IFS high res in red, which is the best numerical-based model. And we can see for a number of variables that we show here, the root mean squared error is lower than those other metrics. Um, indicating a better forecast. And we perform this many different forecasts. So we don't just look at one particular forecast. We run this for years in a hindcast type mode. And then we evaluate these forecasts. And we can see that we're doing significantly better, especially in the later lead times than the other models, um, even going out to 14 days, which is quite remarkable in delivering highly accurate and quick forecasts to the end users of this. Um, as I mentioned, the other application that has been very interesting is climate. This is a significantly different task than just working for weather forecasting. Instead of having to predict the weather 14 days in the future, we have to come up with a single training that can allow for a model to be stable for hundreds, if not thousands of years of simulation. So not just doing a few autoregressive steps, we're now doing tens of thousands, if not millions of autoregressive steps. So this is a monumental task but machine learning seems to be up for it. Um, in this particular case, the details, things like we use neural operators because they have a nice property on the sphere, and we can significantly increase the amount of simulation that we can do now. So traditional climate models that run on CPUs and use numerics can maybe run 100 years of simulation per day, but because we use machine learning and accelerated hardware, we can now run 6,000 years of simulation per day, of which are stable out to at least 1,000 years. So this is kind of now giving us very large data sets to evaluate how things like climate and climate change are affecting rainfall. And just because you can run something for a thousand years doesn't mean your model actually faithfully reproduces the climate. But here we can look at ERA5, which is considered the ground truth, Lucy in the middle, which is our um, emulator, and then the biases compared to that over a 500 year um, simulation. And we can see that the emulator, despite only being trained to predict the six hours into the future, when autoregressively stepped for hundreds of years, can reproduce the general circulation. So this is kind of another new paradigm shift that is entering the field. So just to quickly wrap up things and be on time, as I mentioned, the advent of scalable machine learning architectures, the vast amounts of high quality data, and the access to large GPU and TPU machines is leading to a paradigm shift. We are getting decades worth of research compressed into just one or two years using machine learning. And these are really having an effect on the field. We are giving the forecasts that are better to the hands of the people who need to make these predictions and hopefully saving lives and property. Um, I kind of teased this at the end, but climate modeling may soon undergo a very similar paradigm shift. Instead of using climate models that are based on numerics, we could very well soon be seeing machine learning based climate models that are telling us what the future climate is going to look like. And for those who are interested in machine learning, as I assume all of you are, weather is a really great test bed for developing new machine learning architectures and you know, playing around with these data sets and um, architectures that you may see. There's a lot of data and it really pushes the limit of the current software and hardware that we have available. And with that, I'll take any questions. Hopefully I have some time. Yeah, I think we have time for a couple of questions. So, so one question that was actually popped up and then seconded in Zoom um, was asking where to 
people can actually access some of the data sets that you're talking about. Um, and we had somebody that that dropped the ERE five link, but link. But are are there specific places they can look at for these data sets? Yeah, ERA five is the data set that we've used for both of these models. Um, we host a lot of this at Argon. Um, I'm not exactly sure uh, how hard it is to get. I don't know what the agreements are, but we have both <laughs> ERA five on the disks at, at um. Maybe I could talk to you guys afterwards if you are interested, and maybe we can give some data. Um, but all of it's freely available. I can drop some links to you, Paige, and you can forward them. But it's all available on the cloud. It just requires a pretty big disk, uh, um, depending on how much data you actually want. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So I think for anybody who might be interested in getting more access to these data sets, ping um, us on Slack, and that way things aren't lost forever on Zoom, and we can probably get you access. Or at least I'll connect you with Troy. Um, yeah. Another question that was asked on Slack um, was from Alfred, and he asked, is the initial condition a snapshot of the climate at a particular time? You don't have a sensor everywhere in the world, so that initial condition profile can't be that accurate. How sensitive is your simulation to initial conditions? Yes. Yeah, so going back to my original slide, which is the quiet revolution that's been numerical based, yes, data simulation is the optimal combination of the sensors that are quite sparse, as you figured, um, with numerical based models that basically mix and match all of that data available and get a actually very accurate representation. Despite only having, you know, a few surface stations, we have satellites that take, you know, minute snapshots of the entire globe now, both during the night and during the day, because we have things like infrared. So um, if you look at this, the reanalysis go that goes back to 1940 is quite inaccurate. Maybe Stormer can only get like four or five days worth of good performance, but with the high quality data that is now available, um, we can get forecast skills out to 14 days that are um, of use to the end user. So yes, as you suggested, you, it's very sensitive to how well the initial conditions are, but um, really since 2000 onwards, since we've had all of these satellites, the quality of the data is remarkably well um, which goes into all of that research. So it's not like machine learning, these models developed in a bubble. We've built upon all of that research that has gone on. It's just more of accelerating the pathword instead of a completely parallel track. Yeah. Another question, how do you leverage GPU to compute? Do you use a vector base? Um, so yeah, we take everything and put it into um, GPU. So all of the linear algebra that goes behind um, the machine learning architectures, the data IO actually we has helped us quite a bit with that. Um, all of those have gone into it for the hybrid models. You can vectorize a lot of these things that are called spherical harmonic transforms. Um, so you can use GPUs. They essentially can be parallelized very well, which is what exactly a GPU excels at. So that's some of the work that's gone into that. Yeah. So we have a couple more questions that keep on coming through, which is great. Um, and we're also, we sort of hit time. So what I'm going to do um, is for all of the questions that people have dropped both in Zoom and also on Slack, I'm going to send them over to Troy later. And hopefully he will be kind enough to answer some of the things that also um, that other people um, sent. Um, and then I'll post that on Slack so people can um, see answers to, to all of the good questions that people are posting. Um, but with that, thank you so much, Troy and Huiho, for coming and, and presenting today. Um, again, for any questions that folks have, both on like the logistics side um, and also on the science and content side, please uh, post them in Slack and we will get to them as we can. Um, and with that, I will see everyone next week. <laughs>